become apparent fairly quickly. Oh, uh, let's see, where, where's, oh, this is what I want to show you. Oh, here's a, here's an example of a Eastern Orthodox church. This is the Basilica of, of San Vital, and it's fascinating, this, this particular, You've got the if you're standing if you're standing in the middle of that you wouldn't know where to look. You really wouldn't know where to look. Now compare that. This is the Canterbury Cathedral. It screams hierarchy. Have, how many of you ever been in Canterbury Cathedral? Anybody? Um, a little bit of trivia. You see how this section of the building is sort of offset at an angle? Yeah. Uh, that's deliberate so that uh, the priest at the high altar doesn't get tunnel vision looking out uh, from here. Although I would argue that if you've ever been in Canterbury Cathedral, there's this, uh, oh, what's that called? It looks like a reredos. It's a big, big, humongous fence with all, all kinds of carvings on it. Where if you're standing out here, you could barely see what was in there. Huh. Um, in the Middle Ages, several things began to occur. You've got the, the church, which is now increasingly in charge of education and in charge they pretty much any education is coming through the church and you've got an explosion of clericalism and one of the things I mean by that is clergy had to celebrate mass once a day every clergy person had to celebrate mass once a day so that becomes really problematic when you only have one altar so there was this explosion of chapels. And actually, a, even a, a better example would be the National Cathedral. But you know, in, in all these different rooms would be all these chapels with all their different altars so that the clergy could celebrate communion so that they could do mass. No one would be there except the priest. The priest would do it all, all by himself. The, the monastic life exploded, where you've got people in monastic orders, and one of the things that, that, that monks did is sing what's called the daily office every day. And the daily office had, you know, what we have now, the vestiges of, of the daily office are morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, and compline. But in the Middle Ages, there were several more uh, whose names I can't recall. And since they were constantly singing, they, the, the big places tended to cordon off this area for the monks to come in and sing the daily office. And everyone else could go on about their business without disturbing the monks. But here, unlike the Basilica of Eastern Orthodoxy, your eyesight is directed that way, or you know, wherever the altar is, screaming again that, that sense of hierarchy. Now, here's another thing to understand about church architecture, and particularly artwork. So in the Middle Ages, the church ruled education. The clergy were people who were educated. The average person was uneducated and couldn't read. They couldn't read the Bible. And even if they could conceivably read in whatever language they spoke, they couldn't read the Bible because it was in Latin. So how do you teach the Bible to people who can't read it? Pictures. 
pictures, hence stained glass windows and carvings. They are ancient multimedia, or they are the ancient graphic novel. They are not a comic book, of course, but they are pictures that are meant to tell the story of the Bible to people who can't read the Bible. And that's why there's all this artwork uh, in various uh, cathedrals. Now, if you want to have some real fun, and hopefully I have a connection. Right, I don't. I thought we got the connection into here. I think those are as far as Guild Hall. But they're talking about the end. Okay. Well, anyway, if you go to the National Cathedral website, they have the coolest thing I've ever seen, ever. They have these virtual tours where you can, like, you click on this, and I, I, I doubt it's still here. Well, is it going to work? It is going to work. So this is the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. <laughs> And this is, you're, you're at the, you know, the, the entrance to the church and you're looking up towards the high altar. And the other interesting thing about this is, look what you can do. What was that built? Now, you can't, it's, you know, it's not coming into focus because it's I don't have a internet connection. Uh -huh. But it's, it's absolutely brilliant. The, the focus, the, the clarity is unbelievable. Um, when was it built? Uh, it was started at the turn, around the turn of the 20th century, or the latter part of the 19th century. And it wasn't completed until in the 1990s. When I was in seminary, it was still under construction in the 80s. <laughs> This is the Reredos of the National Cathedral. And like all Reredoses, there is a focal point. And everything around it is in some, it's somehow bringing your focus back to the center. There, there may be, in this case, there, I don't know who all these statues are. They're probably saints. They're probably various people from scripture all testifying to Jesus, who in, in this rendition is holding, uh, well, you really can't make it out, but he's holding, he's got the world in his hands. <laughs> he's got the whole world in his hands. Um, absolutely beautiful. If you're, ever, if you're ever able to go up there, the, the Washington the National Cathedral, by the way, is also built so that the, the choir area is just a little offset from the nave so that if you're standing, you can actually stand behind that high altar. And when you look out from there, <coughs> excuse me, all right, let's see if anything's in focus. Ah, there it is. So that's what you're looking at. This, of course, being the choir area. Of course, the National Cathedral built long after monasteries were a big thing. But this is the vestiges. This is where the monks would have come in and come in to sing. And if you're looking from the high altar straight out, you, can, you can't really tell from this picture necessarily, but there's just this little angle to prevent you from getting tunnel vision. Uh, I've, I've been on a tour of the National Cathedral for seminarians, and they took us in places where no one else is allowed to go. And they sh they took us to this room and this room. And you know what they're you know what they are? Dressing rooms. They're closets. Nothing in them. Mops, buckets. <laughs> uh, but it's a cathedral, so we make them look really cool. Uh, holy mops. One one is like a, a place to. 
clean things, like clean vessels and things like that. So oh, set aside. Set, set aside. Go ahead. It's, it's holy. They're yeah. sacred. They're sacred Canada plazas. Uh, I thought this was a really cool uh, awesome picture. Now you're suspended above the National Cathedral and looking looking down at it. And this is just this is just so cool. You can look down on the whole thing. So you know, go go to the National Cathedral website and go look at this. I think it's it's well worth. The, your time. So there are actually seats in those windows that I've seen across the halls. I'm sorry? Are there like places for people to sit during service across right the Right here? Yeah. No, no, that's that's a, it's a, it's a walkway. I mean, they, maybe they could put people in there to, to sit. See, if they've got places over here to, to uh, seat people. Check out the stained glass windows. Uh, I almost think you'd have to be on those walkways to see them from inside. Huh? Yep. The other thing is, so uh, we were we were taken into there's an area above these flying buttresses, and we were able to look down on when you're looking down on the flying buttresses from above. It's it's. It's actually, I, it was frightening because you're you're looking from the <clears throat> from above this area that goes like to these each of these columns. It's like the column from above it disappears into blackness, and it's like I don't want to fall in there. <laughs> um, it was very very eerie uh, to look at. It. Um, not to get off topic, but do you know how like the um, Nat, the Episcopal Church got to have the National Cathedral? Is that like? No, I'm sorry. What? Not to get off topic, but how? That's an Episcopal Cathedral. Mm -hmm. How did that become the National Cathedral? Well, it was always the National Cathedral. It was always designed to be the National Cathedral. So I mean, I just would think in Washington to choose a like, how do you? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know the answer to the history of, of you know, why it was built, how it was built. Um, but it, you know, back back in the day, a great many of the leaders of the America of, of America were of this family. Oh, okay. And had the money. And had we had the money. <laughs> Not necessarily the case. Well, though. that's good. Um, so now to high altars. You can probably guess that one of the things that the architecture is trying to communicate in Gothic, and I'm talking about Gothic architecture now, is is there is this sense of hierarchy, but there's also this sense of the high, the high altar being heaven. And when you think about the liturgy, there's this interesting sort of movement occurring in the liturgy where people come <coughs> in from the world and they, they come in church and we listen to God's word and we're moved to respond to God's word by uh, reaffirming our faith, saying our prayers, confessing our sins. We share peace with each other. We are now in a position, having done all that liturgically, we're in a position where we're reconciled with each other and with God, and now we're going to have communion with God. And so the, the movement continues to take us forward as we then go up to heaven to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And that's a very powerful, <coughs> powerful image. Unfortunately, in the Middle Ages, it didn't always happen because lay people didn't take communion, necessarily. The, the problem in the Middle Ages was that the Eucharist became more visual than participatory. 
And the high point for the average person in the pew or the nave wasn't going up to receive communion. It was watching the priest elevate the bread and wine, which meant that it had now become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And, ooh, you know, bow before the Lord because he's now in the building. Uh, literally, uh, he's, he, this bread and wine has become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, fast forward to the 1960s in Vatican II. The, the liturgical movement or the liturgical renewal, uh, one of the, uh, the emphasis and one of the things that, that Vatican II was trying to accomplish was a, a sense of we are the ministers of the gospel and we are the, are the church. We are the gathered community. And how do you communicate that? How do you communicate that sense of we are in this together and, and, and de-emphasize somewhat the hierarchy of the church. One way to do that when you're stuck with Gothic churches is to bring the altar out away from the high altar and put the priest on the other side of the altar so that everyone can see, everyone can hear, and everyone can participate in the Eucharist. And so this is a picture of Trinity, Tr Trinity Episcopal Church in Wall Street. And if I can just make a little digression, I want you to notice that, that, those, those be televisions on the columns in the sacred building. Why? I can see that here, just saying. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, Trinity, they no longer use this at all. <clears throat> this is their altar. And like us, they built this platform, they brought it out quite much farther than we did, and uh, consequently were able to make a, a, a larger altar. And here's one of the things that I like about that. Let's think about this theologically. Remember what I was saying about movement. Let me turn this off. So we have this sort of It's just a powerful symbol 
of, of God coming to us. Uh, Philippians 2, you know, God didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. And, and that's what's being conveyed, in my opinion. It's one of the things that can be conveyed. Uh, <clears throat> I may be jumping around a little bit. Many of you have probably have seen this. This used to be in the hallway, um, the office hallway. Uh, this is Christ Church. And originally, you might want to get up and come over here. So that's the original building. And if you look very carefully, there's a house located where the Tudor type office building is located now. And the back of the church at that time, there's the, there's the back, what we would call today the high altar, wasn't a high altar, it was an apse, which is a, an apse is simply a word meaning rounded uh, wall. So that was the, uh, the original plan. And over time, it began to evolve. This is in uh, the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s time period. All these pictures, by the way, are, I, I think they were even taken the same day. And they're all, they're all numbered. This is actually labeled wrong, just, just mm -hmm. FYI. Um, these two photos are from the 19, around 1920, 1923 or so, when expansions began. You all recognize this building? Right. Okay, we're, we're in it, except the bed room wasn't there. This was added on, and of course now there's the tower out here, which simply hides the fire escape from upstairs. It looks really fancy, but it's just covering the stairs. Um, <laughs> and, if, and if you want to look at this later, these stained glass windows in the apse, the apse is still present, but these stained glass windows, which were very simple and plain, have been changed, and now they're quite elaborate, but they're not the stained glass windows that are there now. And I haven't looked carefully to see whether these still these stained glass windows have been like maybe they're over here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure. So uh, remember, I'm, I'm jumping around. I know, but remember, you know, Christmas. What we do at Christmas and the star and all that. Mm -hmm. You ready to see that? So this is 1920. Blah, 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 whatever it is. There's the there's the garland and there's a little star. Traditional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Under Dr. Bennett, a major renovation began, and then the, the apse was, obviously that whole wall was, was, was destroyed, the, uh, the, the, the chancel was pushed back, and uh, the, the chancel as we, we know it today was, was built. Uh, parenthetically, we, this is an uptown church and Upjohn's known for the narrow chancels. But my, my question is, was it an Upjohn that did the renovation? And I'm not sure the answer to that. The original church was built by John Upjohn, Up but the chancel, as we, understand, as we know it today, was built much, much later. Now, with the new design, or what if they just take the Upjohn design and keep it flowing, just continue with it, or? No, I mean, if you if you look if you, if you just if you look carefully at these these photos of the high altar area, and and this organ right here, this is the walkway now where you know the organ is now. where the organ is now. There's no cement. There's no there, there's no stone. There's nothing. The the goal was to create an, an English-looking cathedral-type place um, and create that sense of heaven in, at, at the high altar. Um, there, was, there, was very, there, was, there was definite thought. There was, in the, in the 1980s, to jump forward, under uh, Al Whistler, there began to be talk of a freestanding altar but it wasn't implemented, in my understanding, until Carl Russell. 
And based on my conversations with people, that was a very uh, controversial uh, period of time. Uh, understandably so. I mean, uh, it's, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, I, in my humble opinion, and I, you know, I'm not here, so I'll speak. I wasn't here at the time, so I'll speak freely. Uh, an opportunity was lost. I think that what we have is the result of compromise uh, that, that came as a result of con the contentiousness. But I think that the opportunity that was lost was that if the platform had been able to come out farther, then, and, and imagine with me for a moment that you had a platform that sort of had a couple of steps down, then when, if you have a significantly sized altar, but it's lower than the, than the chancel floor where the choir sits. Now you've got, I think, the potential for a very powerful architectural image where the, the freestanding altar doesn't block the high altar or the reredos, but now gives you this powerful visual of heaven uh, coming to earth. Um, and that, that was the opportunity that was lost. So what we ended up with is the reason the altar is the size that it is, is if you've ever been up there, you can see that it just can't fit. It, it, it has to go between the, the two prayer desks where I sit and the other layperson sits and for us to be able to get around it. And, and then, of course, it gets moved from week, week after week. But uh, anyway, so if we had $10 million dollars dropped in our lap and we were trying to figure out what to do with it, I might throw it out there. <laughs> uh, that, might be, that might be something we do. So, um, I mean, in a nutshell, that's, that's the whole bit about the high, high altar. It, it architecturally is meant to convey the, the sense of heaven and, and going to heaven of being, of being made worthy through the blood of through Jesus and what He's done to boldly, you now I'm borrowing language from the book of Hebrews, to boldly enter the throne room of God. And I, I think that one of the benefits of the re renewal movement, the uh, excuse me, the liturgical movement of the 1960s, was to try to emphasize in some way also an incarnational aspect. Of, of the Eucharist that brings the sense of God coming to us. Any questions about that? Not really, but I was just thinking of there's certain uh, Protestant churches that you go to where the, the Lord's Supper, I guess it is, that you actually stay in your seat and it comes around. Right. And I was thinking at first, it's like, well, that's God coming down to the people, but what you say is there's a, a bilateral movement because right. if we have to go towards God, we can't just sit in the seat. Right, right. And then there's the whole, the whole issue of what's going on in the Lord's Supper. Right, right. Different thing, but... Right. So it's but kind but of, it's kind of passive, then. You're just sort of sitting there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and the, our liturgy used to be passive, too. I mean, in this in the sense that pretty much the only thing we did was come forward for communion. But we, we didn't participate all that much. And that's another aspect of the, of the liturgical movement was to increase participation of lay people and the whole worshiping community in the worship service itself. So those of you who remember uh, the 1928 prayer book and before, I actually did know someone in Selma, Alabama who complained about that new prayer book and she meant the 1928 prayer book. Oh. <laughs> uh, it took me a while to figure it out. As she was talking, I'm like, what, what prayer book are you talking about? The, 1920, well, the 1928 prayer book? I'm like, oh, she was still on the 1829. Uh, or 18, 1898 prayer book. Anyway, uh, moving on. Changing, the, changing our focus from architecture to something else completely. Why do we read the psalm by half verse? <laughs> Throw everybody into chaotic spasms because they don't know where we are anymore. That's an ancient name. No. <laughs> no. 
And I'm probably not going to spell this right. But I spell parallel. L-L-E-L. Parallelism. Hebrew poetry, and there, there are different kinds of parallelism, and not all Hebrew poetry is in parallelism. But parallelism is a dominant form of poetry in Scripture, in the Psalms, in uh, other poems that are in various books of the Old Testament, where a thought is conveyed and then a thought is echoed in different language, different wording. And most of the time it's obvious. If you just you're reading it and you're oh, you know, we're, we're just saying the same thing. Today's psalm, mm, not so much. There's a hint of some parallelism in a couple of verses, but most of it, mm -mm. Uh, it really is a parallel. There's also an antithetical parallelism where you've got a thought and then an opposite thought. And also the parallelism isn't always located in the same verse. Sometimes the parallelism is, is located in verse to verse. So instead of reading at the half verse, you need to be reading verse, 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 verse to really get the parallelism. But we, like, this is the downside of liturgical churches. We get into habits. And they become very, very difficult to break the, the habits. It's called tradition. <laughs> no, habits, no. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, uh, it does. It becomes tradition. And um, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that to, to decide how it should be read either is going to require those of us who plan the liturgy to look at it carefully in advance and, and, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, we probably should, and then instruct the readers somehow to say, this Sunday, this is how you're going to read the, uh, the, the psalm. The other is to let the reader decide on the fly uh, or ask them to look at it in advance and make a decision about whether, they're gonna, whether we're going to read it by half verse or whole verse. But the bottom line is, is it doesn't have to be read the way that we read them. It can be read in unison. I would argue that today's psalm, yeah, could probably be read in unison very easily and would work. But there are other ways to do the parallelism. You can get really creative and say, all right, this side of the congregation does yes, the that first verse, and this side of the congregation, that will probably confuse the heck out of everybody. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 one, it's one of those things that if you've done it for a while, you, you, sort of begin to go with the flow. So you've got, you, know, you can break it at the half verse, you can break it at the whole verse, you can read it in unison. Uh, it all depends really on the poetry. And, and, and there are also types of poetry in, in the Bible and the Psalms that really you can't, there isn't any way to do it by just how we read. The, there's some poetry that's based on, um, what's it called when, like if you have the, the alphabet, the, the acrostic. Hebrew alphabet. Acrostic. Uh, acrostic, that's it, acrostic. So some of the poetry is acrostic using the Hebrew alphabet. You can see it in the Hebrew if you can read Hebrew, but once you translate it into English, it's lost. So, but you, there's no way to read the poetry to convey that. So that's the those are the that's the psalm. I said uh, something last week during the sermon. I think about incense, uh, and just to be clear, incense goes all the way back to the Old Testament, and I think that religions from across the world have always used incense. And well, wasn't um, John's father going into that little room? Wasn't he going to be setting incense? Um, John the Baptist's father. His wife. Oh, 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 oh. Um, yes, when, when, uh, he goes, Elizabeth. Trying to find what's his father's name. Elizabeth. Zachariah. Zachariah. Thank you. Woo. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Zach, Zachariah is praying. Yes, and, and, and incense. Incense was routinely used in the, in the temple. 
it has multiple reasons, but there are multiple reasons for incense, and, and I joked about it last Sunday that it, it partly is to hide the smell um, of animals. I mean, you know, in, in, in the temple, what are they doing? They're slaughtering animals for sacrifice. So what kind of odor are you going to get? The odor of death. Okay, you've got rotting animal stuff. Okay, you can wash it as, as best you can, but it's, it's going to stink. So, incense. And, and that has continued uh, all the way through the Middle Ages. Um, so it, it's always had this sort of dual purpose. Uh, I think that the truth be told, it was primarily to cover odors, but like everything we do in church, we very quickly apply spiritual theological meaning to the things that we do, um, which makes sense, I mean, when you think about it. Uh, how many of you, who can tell me what hallelujah means? Praise the Lord. Yes. How'd you know that? It kind of makes sense. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's, what, that's, uh, that's what it means. In the service of Holy Communion, at the very end of the Eucharistic prayer, when I, I raise up the elements, we all say Amen. And notice that the word is all capital letters. It's called the Great Amen. It's not just any Amen. It's the Great Amen. So should we be like shouting Amen instead yeah. of saying yeah. Amen? In, in, a, in, a, in a word, it should be Amen! <laughs> because it's the people's Amen. And, and this, is, this is an important thing to convey, that you're not spectators watching the priest do all the work and saying all the prayers. I'm doing the talking, but you're praying with me. And I, I see that uh, along the way that other clergy have apparently taught you all this, or at least some of you this. Because I can see and even hear sometimes people saying the words with me, or uh, even moving their hands uh, with me. And all of those, I think, are appropriate ways of, of participating and entering into what is our prayer over this bread and wine. And so when we come to the end of that prayer, it's Amen. So, I expect to hear it. <laughs> and everyone else be going, yeah. <laughs> I already mentioned the, the, the Reredos and stained glass windows. I created, by the way, and I, uh, there is one right there behind you, a guide to our Reredos and our, and our carvings that I, I was, I've tried to print out and I had some problems with, with the printer at church. But like, uh, you know, like all Reredoses, there's a focal point. The focal point is the birth of Jesus. We've got Mary and Joseph and Jesus and actually two lambs uh, sort of peeking over, uh, looking at the manger. And everything around it is about that story. All the, the, the various carvings, they're all about the birth of Jesus. And so once you know who these figures are and what's going on, you realize that the whole thing is constantly sort of drawing you back uh, to the center of, of the, the focal point, which is powerful. It, it's, and and it's, worth, it's worth looking at stuff like that to remind yourself, if, or to learn for the first time if you didn't know, what, what's going on in that, in that wood carving. The, the, the lectern and the pulpit uh, aren't quite as obvious. I mean, to me, there, there's, some, there's some people in the pulpit that I'm kind of curious about why they're there. 
And one is Alexis Stein, who was the, I think he was like the seventh rector of Christ Church. He wasn't here that long. I can't find anything about him, so I have no clue why he's included in the pulpit. But he must have been loved by someone. Um, or he had a lot of money. Or, <laughs> which would be unusual. <laughs> I mean, Phillips Brooks is there. Makes perfect sense. Who's he? Phillips Brooks was a bishop of Massachusetts, and at the time, the entire state of Massachusetts was one diocese. And Phillips Brooks is one of the most famous Episcopal preachers ever. That doesn't mean that you should have known him. I grew up Catholic, what I understand. Can I say? But, but he, he famous, famous preacher, and, and for his preaching. The Trinity Copley Square was where he was a priest before he became a bishop. And if you go there, the pulpit is massive, partly because he was a really big guy. But uh, it, it, it just screams preaching is, is important here, and, and in large part, I think, because of Philip Brooks. But the other, uh, John Wesley's there. Uh, he makes sense. John Chrysostom uh, was known as the golden tongue uh, preacher. And, but Girolama Savernola, I have no idea. He, he's a saint in Roman Catholic, in the Roman Catholic world, and I don't know anything about him. But uh, anyway, so that's the pulpit. There's, if you want to look at it, you can. If you, if you, want, uh, if you want a copy, just ask me. And I'll print you out a copy. Okay, well, I guess we're running out of time. Um, just one more thing. Is anybody here Jenny Fleck? Anybody know what Jenny Fletcher is? That's oh, when you get out of the pew and you kneel. And you know why you do that? No idea. No idea. Because the Catholic priest told me to do it. That's yeah. why I did it. If, if you genuflect, you only genuflect when the sanctuary lamp is lit. When the lamp is right? lit. Right? When there's a flame in the lamp, that means that Jesus is in the building, in the tabernacle. And so if you're a genuflector, you genuflect. If the candle is out, it means there's no reserved sacrament, and you don't genuflect. Huh. Now, there's really only one time a year when there's nothing in reserved sacrament. And that is after the service of Monday, Thursday. Uh, excuse me, Good Friday. Any, anything left in reserved sacrament is consumed on Good Friday so that on from, from the end of Good Friday through Easter morning, if there were any services, you wouldn't genuflect because Jesus has left the building uh, um, in, in, in that part. So, all right. Any, any questions? Any, anything that, uh, any burning questions about what we do that you'd like me to talk about at some point? to think about it. All right. All right. See you next week.